Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits, a finished sock project, and a finished spinning project. So let's get started. So I've talked about the Wool Channel a number of times. It's a website created last year by Clara Parks, who is a wool expert, and it focuses on all things wool. So there's a podcast and there's a free weekly newsletter where Claire shares what's going on in the world of wool. But there are also some areas that are available only to members, including the community forums, where there are sections on like science and upcoming events and history and culture, things that you can read about that related to wool. And then there are also, uh, there's also a section on wool and craft. So I was on there the other day and I saw that someone had linked to an article on what Colonial Williamsburg does with its rare sheep wool. So I'm going to link down, uh, I'll link to that article down below. For those of you outside the U.S. who might not know what Colonial Williamsburg is, uh, that's a, a historic, it's like a living history museum in the state of Virginia. Uh, Williamsburg was one of the very first settlements in Virginia. So it's a living history museum and the people who work there are dressed in 17th century clothing and they are going about their days doing the tasks of a 17th century resident. So you can see all sorts of crafts and skills that people at that time would have had and you can watch them do that. So the sheep that they have there in Colonial Williamsburg are Lester Longwell sheep. And as I was reading the article, there was a sentence that said, the weavers use the wool for dyeing and other projects, including bed rugs and blankets for the horses. So I did not know what a bed rug was, so I Googled. <laughs> and here's the thing, that language is tricky and it evolves, and just like our living conditions evolve and change. So if you actually Google what is a bed rug, you're going to get a whole lot of hits for a product that you can use to line the bed of your Ford F-150 pickup truck. <laughs> so then if you eliminate the word truck from your search results, you'll find a product that is called a bug rug, that, or not a bug rug, a bed rug that is meant to be put between your mattress and the bed frame. So something that goes underneath your mattress. So I had my doubts that even that the second one was accurate. So I kept looking and I found a picture of a bed rug in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of New York. And so it's a beautiful and they explain like how it was made and they're showing that there's initials in it and they, you know, you can look at it all you like, but one thing that they don't tell you is what it was actually used for and you don't have any sense of how it draped. So when I think of a rug, I think of something that's on my floor, and if you were to lift it up, it's fairly stiff. I mean, it is flexible, it's fairly stiff. So I was just trying to figure out what could this thing be, and was it used, it was described, I found something, a description that it was something that was on top of the bed, but I didn't know if it was essentially a blanket if, or if it was if it functioned differently than a blanket. So I finally um, found an article on another website called Self Taught Genius, and the article is called American Rugs on Beds, Tables, and Floors. So it's an article on all sorts of types of rugs and very few of the ones mentioned in the article are actually about rugs that are used on the floor. So they were talking about historically that uh, if you wanted something that actually covered your entire floor, you would order a carpet and you'd probably import it. But they did sometimes have little rugs that you might make that you'd put in front of a hearth, but rugs more than likely were used for other things and including 
for your lap. Like if you were going outside in a carriage ride or something, you might have this rug on your lap um, or you'd have this rug on your bed. So finally, I looked up the word rug in the Merriam-Webster dictionary and the first entry is lap robe and which actually a link to another entry that defines what a lap robe is. The second entry was a floor covering. The first known use of rug in the English language that's in print was in the sense of a lap robe and that was back in 1591. It just goes to show that even if you know where you might find something like a bed rug, um, that it might be on a bed that doesn't necessarily tell you how it was used and it doesn't tell you how it felt. What I got from looking at these pictures and reading these articles was, was that bed rugs were, I, I gather, used for warmth, but they were more elaborate than something like a woven blanket would be. They were embroidered or they might have this kind of wool pile on them, these looped bits of loops that might be cut to create a pile or the loops might be left. So they were thicker and they were more decorative in nature, but it sounds like they were also still had a practical use, which was to keep you warm when you were in bed. This next tidbit was sent to me from Kathy on Ravelry. Her Ravelry name is, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Tragstad. Trista, Trista, something like that. And she said, I stumbled upon a YouTube video today filmed in 1978 in the villages of Kilcar and Carrick in County Donegal. It includes sheep and adorable little grandmas who demonstrate prepping fleece, which is then spun on the big wheel. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So I was, from that description, I was fairly certain I had seen the video before and even that I might have shared it, although I might have shared it in a casual Friday before I had this tidbit section, I might have shared it in some other context. I'm not really sure. I knew that I wanted to go ahead and watch it again because I hadn't seen it in a while. The video is called Hands and I'm going to leave a link to it down in the show notes. So what they're talking about in this video, so this is a video that was filmed almost 45 years ago, but they're talking about how much the wool industry had changed in Ireland from what it had been historically, and that in the past, um, most families had a couple of sheep that they kept uh, on their property that had two purposes, some food, but also it would supply the family with their wool that they would then turn into uh, so socks and, and sweaters and things like that. So the first part of the video is showing these men in sort of this market town area and they're haggling over the price of sheep and how much they're going to pay for them. Uh, and they talk about um, the, the previous customs that, that there would have been like traveling tailors that would have gone door to door and spent a week at somebody's home while they would make somebody a full suit of wool clothing. And the, you know, those days are gone. Um, but then the, the next half of the video is showing these older women uh, who are preparing the wool. So the first thing is they show somebody shearing the sheep by hand using hand shears, not like electric clippers. Um, and then they, the women are, are cleaning the wool outside in these kind of plastic tub type of things. Cleaning the wool, leaving it out to dry. And then they are preparing, they put oil on their wool. So they don't explain exactly how they clean the wool. Like if they are using some sort of a detergent or something that really gets a lot of the lanolin out, like maybe more lanolin out than they than they needed to. It's not clear to me why they were pouring oil on top of their wool. The spinning wheels that they use in the video, they call them the big wheel. Uh, other names for this type of wheel is a great wheel. Uh, sometimes it's called a, wa a walking wheel. And so it's, it's a type of wheel that predates a treadle spinning wheel with a, a flyer and bobbin system. This type of spinning wheel has a, a much larger drive wheel and you don't treadle it. The spinner spins it with her hand. And then there is, instead of a bobbin and flyer system, there is basically a sharp stick. 
um, that is a spindle and that is what you're, you're spinning off of the tip of it. And the system for spinning in this type of spinning wheel is uh, wool and spun. You're not doing worsted spinning and you have to be able to draft the wool out with one hand because the other one is spinning the actual wheel. So it's a, it's a really interesting process. It is so different from the type of spinning that I do at my spinning wheel. Our Weavers Guild uh, leases several different rooms for classrooms and things like that at our textile center. And one of the rooms has tons of spinning wheels. Some of them uh, you can check out and then there's others that are there that you can go and practice on. You can try them out. Like if you're gonna buy a spinning wheel, you could try them out. Um, and then this great wheel is there, but that one is so different. I I don't know like how you learn to use that. Like you might need to find a teacher who is registered with the Weavers Guild that they're allowed to use it because they have some e-spinners at the Weavers Guild as well, but you are not allowed to use them until you've taken a class on how to use it. So it's just such a different process. I would love to be able to spend some time doing that. But I got so much out of seeing this video a second time. And I think part of it is just over the past couple of years, I've learned a lot more of just about yarn and how it's made and different ways things can be spun. And I just understand more about spinning altogether. I'm by no means an excellent spinner. I just have gradually been accumulating uh, information. So uh, again, I'll leave that link to that video down below because I think it's it's fascinating to see a, a system that is, is so different and just not used very often and that these were people who were still using this method 45 years ago. This tidbit is sort of an update from one I mentioned back in December. Allison Korlewski, uh, who works at Interweave, has a podcast called Fiber Nation. And back in December, she presented the first part of a two-part series on the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, which was one of the deadliest industrial disasters in our country. The fire caused the deaths of 146 garment workers, most of whom were women and even girls as young as 14. Uh, they died from the fire or from smoke inhalation or from falling or jumping to their deaths in order to escape the fire. So I recently checked to see if the second part had come out because the first part came out in December, in the middle of December, I think December 16th. And I couldn't tell from the dates of the previous podcast if they had a regular schedule because sometimes they would be two weeks apart, three weeks apart, might be a month apart. So I just wasn't sure when the second part would come and I stopped looking for it after a while. The holidays came and went and you know, I, just, I wandered off. So I did look the other day and the second part came out February 17th. So if you haven't heard the second part or if you haven't heard either part, you might be interested in that story. It's a disaster that has always interested me for a couple of reasons, um, because it's it's young women, young working women over a hundred years ago, which I was interested in, and they were in the garment industry. I've always been interested in textiles and making things, so that was interesting. But when I started researching my husband's family history, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, we saw that a large number of his family immigrated to New York City uh, in that area, in that area very close to where the garment district was. And many of them actually worked in the garment industry uh, when they first came. And some of them then gradually moved on to, to other things, but quite a few of them were working in, uh, in the garment industry at the time of this shirtwaist factory fire. So I always wondered how that affected them and if their own working conditions were similar to that or somehow different. If you're interested, I've got links to that podcast down below. Last week, I told you guys the story of the socks that I've knit for my brother over the years, and I was showing you one of the very first pairs of socks I knit for him that were in pretty bad shape, and then I had started knitting him a new pair. So I'm gonna be seeing my brother this weekend. So I hurried up and finished the pair, and I washed him last night, 
and hung them up over the wooden laundry rack down in the basement. And I'll be ready to pack them up in my suitcase tonight and take them to Michigan. Uh, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about the construction of these particular socks and then how I addressed his particular fit issues because he has very large feet and, um, and that affects uh, a lot of different things during the, the knitting process. So uh, I want to go to the overhead and take you on a tour of those uh, finished socks. This is the pair of socks I was showing you guys last week. This is the second pair of socks I ever knit for my brother back in 2013. So I fixed this when I patched it up. I don't know if he's actually gonna be able to wear this comfortably. I'm going to Michigan this weekend. I'll see him, so I'll return these socks to him. And then I will also give him the new pair of socks that I started, I don't know, a week or so ago. So one of the things he said about the last pair of socks I just knit him, that I sent to him in December, was he liked how long the legs were. So one of the challenges with knitting socks for my brother is that he has a, a pretty large ball of foot. He's got a, a, a foot that's 11 inches in circumference. His ankle is 10 inches in circumference, so it's not as big around. But just because of that kind of circumference, that chews up yarn. So I wanted to give him a sock leg on this one that was as long as possible. I tend to like to match the, the stripes on socks. So like these two socks, the, the striping pattern matches. Um, that's just naturally something that I personally like, so I always do that for other people. But in order to make the leg as long as I thought he would want it, I could either do a contrast heel or I could not make any effort to try to match the stripes. And he said either one was fine. He didn't care about stripes matching. So I divided the ball exactly in half and I did a, a toe up sock. So for the, the different elements I use for this particular sock are a wedge toe. Uh, this is this is a toe that can be done cuff down or toe up. Typically, the way this type of toe is knit is that you do a decrease at each end of the sole and each end of the instep, and then you so you're doing four decreases, and then you do a plain round, and then you do the four decreases, and you keep doing that until you have about a third of the stitches left, and then you graft the toe if you're doing cuff down. If you're doing toe up, you'd start with a closed cast on like Judy's Magic cast on, and then you'd work for increases, a plain round for increases, etc. My brother, although he has uh, feet that are large in circumference, his toes are, are pretty short for the length of his foot. And so typically what I have to do is adjust uh, the toe length so that the sock toe is actually the length of his physical toes uh, rather than um, something else because his toes are barely two inches they're a little over two inches maybe a two and a quarter inches um, but if I if I worked 
a plain round after every shaping round, whether it was a decrease or an increase, these toes would be maybe three inches long instead. And then that would be too late to get to the full circumference for his ball of foot measurement. So I have videos on how you can customize the length of sock toes, particularly the wedge toes. So I'll link to those uh, above there. I have them for all different kinds of toes. I typically explain how to adjust that measurement, but I'll put the ones for this type of toe uh, at the top and also down in the video description. So I just started with wherever I was. I didn't care uh, what where I was in the color sequence. And this is also kind of... Um, uh, it's, it's a striping sequence, but it's one where colors are mixed together within the stripes. So it kind of eliminates that ability to see exactly where the stripes are. It's kind of a, an optical illusion. The heel I've been using the past couple of years just because it was new to me and I think it's interesting and it's fun is a plain heel. So a plain heel is the same as an afterthought heel, peasant heel, whatever you want to call it except that you work the heel when you get to that point in the sock. So an afterthought heel or a peasant heel, typically you're knitting the, the, the full tube of the sock and then you come back and you open it up and you knit the heel. So the heel is worked in the round toward this direction. So there's all different ways that you can do the, the line of decreases. Uh, this one is is the, exactly the same as you would do a toe like this. So there's two knit stitches in between the, the decreases. And in this case, his heel isn't short. It's, it's exactly the length you need to, in order to work this as a standard heel. And so I work four decreases, plain round four decreases all the way down until I'm down to, um, for his sock, 20 stitches. And that's what I started with up here. So he needs a heel that's longer than his toe because he actually needs a fairly short, short toe. For me, I can work a wedge toe exactly as written and it will fit me, but I need a lot more stitches uh, and more rounds in order to have a heel that fits my foot because I have kind of a skinny ankle, but I have a long heel diagonal. So I have to make adjustments in a different way for me. I've also done all kinds of videos uh, on the on how to make that kind of thing fit as well. So I knit the foot and then I went right into the heel. So you do a provisional cast on here. Uh, you work the heel, you come back to the provisional cast on and then you uh, work the leg. So I calculated how long I wanted the leg to be um, and I ended up with a little bit of yarn left over, but I didn't actually want to extend it all the way because then I thought, first of all, it's going to run up into his calf muscle and it might end up being too tight there. So this is plenty long. If you compare it to the length of these socks right here, you can see these are, are quite a bit longer. So I think he'll be pr really happy with this. And then I'll also, when I'm in Michigan this weekend, I'll have him try them on and I'll see if he would prefer the sock be a different length than that. Uh, again, I couldn't have worked it too much longer. I could have worked a few more rounds longer than this, but if that's something that would be okay with him, if he can have a maximum length that's a little bit longer than that, then I'll do that next time. So when I started the second sock, he said he didn't care if they matched. And I started the second sock and I thought, geez, it's like, it's going to match perfectly without me even trying. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's lucky. Usually with self-striping yarns, by the time I get to the, the heel, the, it, I'm usually off a little bit, like the sequence gets off a little bit. And so then, and then when you get up to the very top, it's, it's off. But I thought that was funny that without trying I was starting at exactly the same place. What happened in the second sock though, was that there was a knot, like they were, the yarn was tied together in the middle of the color sequence. So I was actually pretty happy that I didn't have to worry about matching stripes in this situation because I would have been really upset to find that stripe, to, to find that knot, and then having to try to wind off yarn in or, order to keep the stripes matching. It didn't end up being too much of an issue. And again, you have this kind of deceptiveness. These stripes here look different than these, but if you turn this over, you can see how the stripes kind of change the, their appearance depending on what side of the sock you're on. 
So it was a little bit different. The heels ended at a slightly different place because I was in a different place in the, in the color sequence when I finished uh, the sock. Oh, I guess this was the second one. So once you get to the very top, they're still kind of close. They're a little bit off, but I was really amazed at how closely these matched without me even trying. It was, it was kind of unbelievable and in some ways a little disheartening that, that it was that easy to get them that close with me literally not trying at all. In the past few weeks, I returned to working on my hand spinning breed study of 30 wool breeds. So I purchased the 30 breed fiber sampler from wool gatherings on Etsy. Um, and then for the summer and well into the fall, I was spinning at least one breed per week. And then I stopped at the beginning of November and took a long break from it. So I got back to it uh, a couple of weeks ago and then earlier this week I finished spinning the last breed. Uh, it's always, I know that I need breaks from projects, that, that's nothing me, I know that I'll get back to them, but I, it's always so satisfying once I actually finish a project like that where it just seems like oh my gosh this is you know 30 breeds I've only done three so far I've got 27 more to go you know it just it seems like it's not going to end so I was really happy to finish that and then I spent the next couple of days just laying that yarns out on the floor <laughs> and on the kitchen table in all different ways uh, looking at at different yarns next to each other and and rearranging them in like color order I had all of the cream colored yarns in order from the lightest to the to the darkest which is more of like um, almost a yellow color and then I had all the natural colored wolves together I looked at the uh, the long wolves together and I, I I've just been looking at them in different ways in order to figure out what to do with them. This is something I've been thinking about since I started is, you know, once I spin these, then what? <laughs> because the purpose of spinning them was to get, just get back into spinning, but get back into spinning, trying a lot of different things that didn't, you know, were, I wasn't going to be spinning an entire project's worth of yarn for something. I wanted to try a lot of different things so I could really get a sense of how different breeds were to spin. Um, but I also knew that once I had 31 ounce skeins of yarn, what was I going to do with those? And I could just keep them as they were, but I, I kind of wanted to turn them into something knitted because ultimately, if I'm spinning for a project, it's going to be knit into something. So I've always thought it's going to be some sort of textile, like a piece of of cloth of some knitted cloth of, of some sort um, where I could identify which area was knit from which type of breed and so that's been part of laying all of these yarns out was just to kind of see uh, what they look like juxtaposed and and to see if I could get some ideas about what I might do. Uh, so I'm going to go to the overhead and I'm going to show you my 30 yarns and I'll talk a little bit about some of the ideas I have about how I can turn these yarns into a reference textile. These are the five long wools that I spun as part of my breed study. That we've got uh, Devon, Lincoln, Masham, or maybe it's Masham. Masham. I can't. I feel like. It isn't what it looks like. I think it might be Massam. Uh, Tease Water, and then the last one is Wensley Dale. These wools have similarities in that, obviously, they were long wools. The staple length was very long. There was very little crimp to them. Some of them with, were much more coarse than others. Some of them are quite silky. So let me just go up close. This was a Devon, so this was an early spin because I, I did spin these in alphabetical order. And I thought, ooh, I don't really care much for this. This would be something that you would use for, like, I guess if you were weaving a rug or something, maybe. It was interesting to spin with this, but it was like, I don't really care to repeat that experience. So the Lincoln was less coarse, but it's still, you know, somewhat similar. Uh, they, they're not exactly the same. Um, this one has a little bit more sheen to it, less 
twine-like appearance. And then you get the Massum, which has more sheen and it actually feels softer to the touch. I mean, it's not like Merino or anything, but it's smoother to the touch. It doesn't, it's not as coarse, but again, it has very specific properties. All of these, none of these have much in the way of give. Like if you pull on the skein, you know, they give a little bit, but, but not really much. This one was the one that I was spinning when I stopped in November and it's called Tease Water. This was one where it was very long and silky. They said in, that this is often used as doll's hair. This kind of fiber is often used as doll's hair, what, which I thought was interesting. And it still feels kind of, it feels, you, you can imagine, oh, this would be a pleasant type of, of wool to have as, as doll's hair as, you know, opposed to something like this, which would not. So, and it's got the shine to it. So I could see why this could be used for doll's hair, why that would be an ideal use for that. And then the last one uh, was Wensleydale. This was one of the very last uh, yarns that I spun and I spun it finer. So it's got a lot, I've got a lot more twist in this one as well compared to some of the other long walls. This one is also pleasant to the touch, but again, it's very different. It's gonna have a lot of drape to it. It doesn't, it's not gonna have uh, much give. So I'm thinking about creating a piece of fabric, a knitted fabric that is made from these three, like in a sampler that's just five swatches long, I'll come up with, you know, whatever needle size I'm going to use and just knit until I get to, um, toward the end. Uh, I might do something because I'm going to just kind of chain these swatches together. I might do something like start, start with garter and keep some garter at the edges, but keep stocking it in the center so that I can kind of compare garter to stockinette and then work the last few rows garter before I switch uh, to the next yarn. So I might just want to do that in order, you know, I'm trying to think of what order I would do them in rather than alphabetical order. I might do them in order of like coarseness and or sheen or something like that. So I, I would keep this one, the Wensleydale here, and then I might uh, adjust these a little bit or just keep them the way they are. These two, I, I might just keep them maybe in this order, but that's my idea for the long wools is to keep them in a separate textile. I have 10 that are sort of natural colored yarns um, I would say fi five of them, these five are what I would consider in the brown range. Uh, I, my monitor is showing this as looking black and these are certainly black sheep, but these are actually very, these two are very dark brown. And then this one is a slightly less uh, brown. And then you have these two and on, on my monitor, this is looking more gray in person it's kind of like a color shift between gray and brown to me. Uh, and then this one is obviously kind of a caramel color. So this is uh, Manx Lochten. This is from the Isle of Man. And I think I did a chain ply on this, but this is like, this has got so much, like if you compare this to those long walls, it's so round and bouncy and squishy. And you know, that that is just, there's such a difference in those kinds of yarns. And this yarn to me is the most different from all of the others in so many ways, uh, in not the least of which is the color. And if you ever took a look at this sheep, this is a crazy looking sheep. It's got so many horns that can be pointed in so many different directions. So I have knit yarn before that contained Man Manx Lochten and I loved it. This one here is Finnish. That's what the label says. I think Finn might be a more common name for it. So this feels very nice. I could see doing a sweater in something like this. Um, and then these three, this is the Zwartless. This is a one, the last one that I knit. Um, and then these two are darker. I really expected this to be as dark as the others. I was just surprised that it, this one wasn't as dark as these two. This is Welsh, and then this one is Jacob. And I, these three are amongst my favorite in terms of the finished yarns. I just feel like all three of them 
ended up with with a yarn that I just like feeling and I like the look at them they're all squishy they're not like super soft but they certainly could be used for a sweater with wearing a t-shirt underneath them um, the hard, the tricky part is seeing what you're doing when you're spinning with something like this and then seeing what you're doing when you're knitting because I knit an Aran sweater with Zwart Bless and that was it was hard to see my stitches and see what I was doing with the cable so it might be something where Maybe this would be something that I would use in a color work situation rather than in a situation where I had to see my textured stitches. These are the other five. And if I put them in order of like color, like th they're like this. So this one is Suffolk. And this is one I actually remember spinning. It's got a lot of Kemp in it. And I think I, I didn't particularly enjoy spinning this. This is definitely something rustic. It's not like that Devon that just felt like twine, but it isn't something I would care to, to spin with or knit with just because of the amount of Kemp in it. This has a fair amount of Kemp as well. This is Swaledale. You know, this is another one where I'm like, this has got to be like something you'd use for like a rug or something. It's not particularly pleasant to the touch and all of the bits, the Kemp sticking out from it uh, makes it less pleasant. I think they pronounce this Herdwick and not Herdick. You can never tell in England. And again, coarse. I think this is one of those uh, traditional breeds. There's a certain amount of Kemp in it. It's a pretty color, but I don't know. Uh, it's kind of what I would call a crunchy yarn, you know, not particularly nice. So this is very similar in color, maybe a little bit softer gray and and this is much more pleasant to the hand. This is, well, this is Icelandic. <laughs> so this is, you know, a quite, quite a different um, experience. But we all know Icelandic is great for things like sweaters. And then this one right here is Gotland. So this is like a traditional uh, Swedish breed. Um, and this one is also very nice um, to the hand. And I know this is often used for hand knitting yarns as well. I think particularly for traditional types of garments and things like that. So now we've got this pile of other wools, 20 other wools, and most of them I think are perfectly lovely for, for hand knitting. They all feel really nice. Some of them feel exceptionally nice. This is Rambouillet, which is basically French Merino, so very, and, and look just how, look how short this skein is compared to one of the long, the long wools. So these were all wound around the same nitty knotty, which, so you, you can just see how much this, this uh, compresses up, you know, from finishing the wool, it just wants to spring back together. That tells you something about the crimp of the wool because this thing is just so straight and this is boing like that. And, the, and look how round it is. I mean, look how much yarn I got out of this compared to this. So it's just such a difference. So I think amongst all of these, uh, is this the Polworth? Yeah, I, 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 like, I saw this. This is the whitest of all of them, I believe, and it's the Polworth. And I mean, the Rambouillet is so springy and nice and, and to the touch, and, and I've knit with Rambouillet before. I know it's nice, but when I, and I've knit with Polworth before too, but when I touch this skein, this is like, just like you could knit something for a baby and have this against the baby skin. It's just so nice. So I've got all of these different wools and some, like this is one of the earliest ones when I was getting back into spinning and I was experimenting with different methods of drafting as well as plying. And I think this was a woolen spun and I may have chain plied it. I don't even remember no this might be this is just a two ply but like this is so uh, thick and springy and it's a woolen spun so I have all of these different uh, wools and there's different colors of creamy of creaminess some of them are almost yellow like this one is quite yellow when you compare it to like the Polworth there's such a difference in color 
so I'm having to think about how am I going to incorporate all of these different yarns into a textile. And I want to use the textile as some sort of a reference document, if you will. So the long walls, I said, I'm going to keep on their own textile. But for the rest of them, I am thinking that I might incorporate them in, that'll be like 25 breeds and I'll maybe do some kind of something that's five squares by five squares. So I may have to decide how big those squares are going to be. What, what do I have the least amount of in terms of yardage and make a square and make the rest of them the same size? Uh, I really don't know. Or I could do things in strips potentially. I really don't know. And I'd like to do it so that the colored wools are sort of interspersed in so that they're not all next to each other, that they are uh, apart from each other. So I've been working with different layouts of uh, different designs of squares. I'm also trying to think about how I'm going to knit those squares. Am I going to do them in garter stitch or am I going to do them in a uh, surrounded by garter stitch but stockinette in the middle so that I can really see what that fabric would be like because it's unlikely that I would knit something in garter stitch as a project. I'd probably want to see what it looks like in stockinette. So I think I might want to mix my stitch patterns as well. So I, I'm thinking about about all of those things and and the order in which they're going to be laid out in this textile. Uh, and I want it to be something that I can look up. Like if I want, I can't remember what uh, the massum looked like. And so I can look on the back side of the textile and, and find the label that says massum and I'll know what it looks like. The easiest way to look them up would just to be put, a, put them in alphabetical order, but that may not be the most pleasing aesthetically. So another thing I'm thinking about is is numbering the squares on the back from one to 25 and then having a, a large label on the back that has them listed in alphabetical order and then the square number next to it, um, numeric square number next to it. So that's, I think, how I'm going to use it as an index type of thing. Uh, it needs to be something that I can potentially use here in my office. If it's cold in the winter, I can put it on my lap or, um, but, and, and easy to get my hands on, easy to put away if I need to. So a garment isn't something I'm interested in doing and a wall hanging wouldn't work very well either just because I don't have much wall space and the wall space I have is pretty high up and that would be really inconvenient. So one thing I know about my organizational style is things have to be put away in a way that it is so fast for me to get them out. I don't mind spending a little time putting something away, but it's got to be pretty easy. Uh, but I absolutely do not want it to be hard to, um, to get out of its storage space. I have learned that about myself in the past year or so. If anybody has some ideas about what this knitted textile should look like, I uh, invite you to leave suggestions down in uh, the comments below. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I'm heading to Michigan tomorrow to visit my brother whom I haven't seen in almost three years. I want to give you a heads up that because I'll be gone and because I'll be doing the driving on this trip, no car knitting, I won't be publishing a Technique Tuesday video or a Casual Friday podcast next week, but I will be back with both on the following week. There are lots of Casual Friday episodes you can watch though. The full playlist is right over here and you can also check out my channel page to find playlists of all sorts of technique videos that you may have missed. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in two weeks.